differences, the, the inequalities that arise in terms of inherited wealth, talent, risk-taking, and, and, and hard work. And then third, this resonates with our sense of fairness. There is increasing evidence uh, in a, a number of different fields, um, uh, the, uh, I should say research domains, indicating that a sense of fairness has deep roots in the human psyche. It's a part of our evolved human nature. And it really goes to the very heart of the, of the enduring problem of how to secure political legitimacy. In fact, it's our chief weapon in the age-old war with the centrifugal force of political alienation and social conflict. John F. Kennedy famously proclaimed that life is unfair and, and, and indeed might, may often prevail, as the old saying goes. But that doesn't make it right and we can tell the difference. Accordingly, two distinct and frequently competing moral claims arise out of the imperatives of human nature and of human society as a collective survival enterprise. One is basic needs or distributive equity and the other is merit. In this paradigm, our basic needs must take precedent, but they don't nullify our claim to merit. They impose a constraint. Thus, there's nothing fundamentally new about what I call enlightened capitalism. However, a fair shares approach explicitly recognizes the validity of both of these claims and, it, and tries to find a way to balance or reconcile them. So, under the category of, uh, under the, the fair shares ethic, uh, the first two principles are that goods and services should be distributed according to, each, to each according to his or her basic needs. And the second is that surpluses, beyond the provision for our basic needs, should be distributed according to merit. Of course, this first principle, distributing to each according to his or her basic needs, is an, a, an echo of Marx. Uh, and I'm well aware of that. But. I want to emphasize that we are not talking simply about a, a concept that would open the door to a society of freeloaders and basic needs are not just another name for a free lunch. The answer to that is that, that such an ethic would indeed be inequitable. The second point is that the collective survival enterprise has always been based on mutualism and reciprocity, perhaps over millions of years, with altruism in being applicable only to, to limited and, and special circumstances under a distinct moral claim, what might be characterized as no-fault needs. So in order to avoid the, uh, creating an ethic that involves freeloading or free lunches, there's an absolutely essential third principle, a corollary. And so the third fair shares principle could be called the reciprocity principle. In return for the benefits associated with the first two principles, each of us is obliged to contribute to the collective survival enterprise in accordance with his or her ability. Obviously, Time is moving on here, and there are many issues raised by this paradigm. Um, some of you might want to claim that it sounds simply like a repackaging of Marxism, but this is emphatically not true. First, it's a combination. It's an integrated package of principles, and that's what makes it unique. But more important, Marx was quite indifferent about rewarding merit. Remember, he was hostile to the capitalist, capitalist system. And in my case, exactly the reverse is true. Uh, some others among you may want to unsheath the so-called naturalistic fallacy, the prohibition against deriving norms from, from facts. This is a hoary uh, uh, dilemma in political theory, social theory that goes back uh, for 100 years. My response to this objection, in brief, is that what we are talking about here are prudential, not categorical norms. They represent if-then principles in the sense that predictable results will occur with or without 
the implementation of these principles. Uh, that, that really is all I have time uh, for. I, I'd be glad to discuss these and, and other uh, issues in the parallel session which will at noon, which has been set up specifically to explore some of these, these issues uh, further. Also, I, as I mentioned earlier, I have a full-length paper on this. I brought a few copies with me if any of you are interested in really going into further depth. To conclude then, capitalism has been an engine of economic growth and progress. It's a proven system. However, the mega threats and the severe economic challenges that almost certainly await us in the future require the development of a more enlightened capitalism. We need to move beyond the Stone Age in capitalist theory. We need a normative framework that, one, recognizes the many dimensions of the basic survival problem, two, fully understands our deep interdependency with respect to the satisfaction of those basic needs, and third, is guided by sound social principles. We need to strike a better balance between the workings of the marketplace and the overarching needs of the collective survival enterprise as a superorganism. In other words, we need to find a middle ground between the legitimate claims of both the holists and the individualists or egoistic uh, models of society. To paraphrase a famous line from the American founding father, Benjamin Franklin, during the darkest days of the American Revolution, either we will all survive together or we will go extinct separately. Ultimately, the choice is up to us. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. We have approximately 25 minutes um, for questions. So. Yes, please. Sorry, oh, uh, do I have to say that again or not? <laughs> At Queen's University, Belfast, Kate Farrell. Um, I found your presentation fascinating, and uh, while I have, um, I, I'd love to talk with you later about points sort of that are probably not relevant here, uh, but one point just in the context of complexity, I'm wondering if you could expand a little on. Um, I'm sorry, let me find my note here. Yeah, you have your list of 14 specifications. And, eight, yes. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm wondering, you said those are science. You said they're science. They're a truth. They're a specific, definite, and you're happy to defend them. And I, I don't mean to sort of surrender them all up here for discussion, but I, I'm interested in how you relate that to the idea of uncertainty and, and the the recognition that when we're dealing with complexity, we're dealing with uh, fractured structures of knowledge where the, a specific truth claim is, is problematic. So for example, I might suggest that I consider fun to be equally important to sleep as a basic necessity of what, it, of what constitutes me being human. <coughs> and uh, I'm wondering I, if you can... I am... Uh, I, my background and my orientation and focus are evolutionary biology. I am talking about biological needs. Now you may do things for any number of reasons or not do it for any number of reasons. And I am talking about the consequences of your choices for whatever the, whatever the basis may be for your survival and reproduction. And I say they are empirically validated in accordance with the canon of science because they have measurable consequences. They will do harm if you are, fail to satisfy those needs. I don't need to tell you about what sleep deprivation does to your ability to function. And, if, and it can get very severe. So deconstructionists may say that, well, sleep is, is, is some you know, normative value and I can take it or leave it. But the point is that it still has a biological basis and biological consequences for your actions in relation to it. Likewise, you know, if, if you go out in freezing cold weather naked, uh, eventually you'll experience the consequences. Yeah, I, I just mentioned the most recent issue, the September issue of uh, Scientific American. Uh, it's fascinating. It's about uh, brains the and brain. betterment. Yeah. Um, 
I see things in that document that suggest to me that uh, brain-mind uh, science is beginning to discover that fun has a survival functional utility. Uh, so I guess the point I'm just trying to make is that uh, when we're talking about complexity and we're talking about ethics and we're talking about organization, that we're talking about an uncertainty that demands us to be as critical with our position on scientific knowledge production as our position on ethical knowledge production or uh, economic system design. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry to say I take exactly the opposite view. I know. That there are 14 basic needs, at least. Those needs are broad domains. There are many facets. There's a, there's a whole category in our paradigm called instrumental needs, which are, which are indirect ways in complex societies in which those basic needs may be met. Uh, for example, an automobile might be a, a base, it might be an instrumental need to meeting some basic need for an individual in a, in a, in a particular environmental context. So everything is interpreted in light of or in relation to that basic need. Now, you can build an ethics any way you want to, but I would say that whatever ethics you adopt is going to have consequences for those basic needs. We're talking about the real world here. Oh, just reintroduce myself. <laughs> right, uh, my name is Kate Farrell, and I'm at Queen's University Belfast, the Institute of Governance. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'm Paul Salier, uh, Philosophy Department, University of Stellenbosch. Uh, I want to continue this discussion. Uh, I have a problem in seeing what, how what you said has anything to do with ethics at all. We cannot disagree with the basic biological needs, that is true. Uh, but you seem to say very little actually about what it is to be human. Those 14 ca categories could, may as well be applicable to, to animals. Uh, and that is fine, but at the end you seem to, to make a shift as if this is some kind of justification for capitalism. Uh, now, at, at that point I, I'm not sure what kind of ethics is at stake here? Is, 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 is this sort of, the natural, naturalistic fallacy does come into play now. Is this some sort of a justification for, for capital, capitalism? Or does it, is there something more at stake when we talk about what it is to be human, which is closer to my understanding of what ethics is about? Uh, I've, gone, uh, I've gone hungry and cold many times in order to buy a book or go to the opera or whatever, choose your example. So, uh, the simplification, I think, uh, is bothering me a little bit. Well, it, you, you really raised actually more than one issue. L let me see if I can go back to the first issue, the relationship between ethics and our biological needs. I, I, I argued, and, and there are, uh, uh, there's support in other recent volumes, the two I cited, I think are a good, uh, a good place to start, F for the argument that, that our behavior f has an influence, has an impact on our capacity to survive and reproduce. We, we are, a, our, our basic problem is to meet our biological needs. And you may have gone cold and hungry, but I'm sure you didn't go cold and hungry for very long, otherwise you'd be dead. Uh, and you knew when to stop, <laughs> so you were you were taking a, a small trade-off in terms of your uh, biological needs, not not serious risk. Uh, and and, and, and but, but the but the point is that in any case, your choices, whether they are individual choices or choices that take place in an ethical context, that is to say, in a social environment where you are in relationships with others, a community of people who are working toward common purposes, that is meeting our basic survival and reproductive needs, you, you, your choices will have an impact, not only on your, the outcome for you, but possibly on the outcome for others in terms of their capacity to survive and reproduce. 
And are you suggesting that we should create an ethics that is cavalier about the biological needs of others and meeting their needs? If so, you're, you're, you're then justifying social Darwinism. Uh, not at all. I'm just saying that uh, uh, ethics seem to be a much more complex issue than just a matter of biological needs. Well, ethicists that make it more complex, but uh, what, what I'm trying to do is to say that one way of looking at ethics is, remember I said, this is not a categorical framework I put up. It's prudential. It means it is designed for a purpose which is to be able to be related to and instrumental to our meeting our survival and reproductive needs. You can, you can uh, indeed develop ethical principles uh, that go beyond that. Uh, I, I would challenge you though not to produce ones that are in conflict with that because you'll soon be in trouble and I'm sure you'll find that, that, that the receptiveness of others to your needs, uh, to, to your ethics, uh, may be low. For example, a, a Jim Jones, uh, I don't know if you remember him, uh, created a cult uh, which uh, uh, committed suicide, women, men, women, and children, uh, 250 of them. This was about 30 years ago. He created an ethics in which suicide was the, the, the ultimate objective. Uh, that is not compatible with our basic survival and reproduction, and there are very few others who would have, uh, you know, other than these 250 people who would have followed his example. Uh, we don't see survival, uh, suicide cults as a, a, uh, a general practice. Uh, most, most religions are life-affirming rather than life-denying. That's an inadequate answer to a very important question, and I, I, I feel that it deserves a much better answer. Uh, Mark Shutton, the Complex Systems Center yeah. in the School of Management at Cranfield. Um, you used the word purpose. You said social purpose. And I find this very difficult. I do not see how a society has a purpose. Um, so societies function and they may have outcomes but I do not see any social purpose well, you would have to give a social purpose to a herd, of a, a herd of animals and I do not see any social purpose to a herd of animals we act and out of that action emerge properties that we, you know, functions like survivability and survivability is clearly an important but it's accidental. Well, I don't think survival or survivability is, is at all accidental, but I would certainly agree that the purposefulness of the superorganism is an emergent property of the fact that we are all interdependent with respect to, and, pers and we do pursue, by and large, our basic needs. Otherwise, we wouldn't si be sitting in this room, uh, much less reproducing the next generation. But surely purpose implies a mind. And there is not a superorganized mind that we know of. There, there are, there, there are, however, Sorry. parliaments that create, that make decisions for the superorganism. And if you want an analogy, leadership, uh, governments, uh, as well as important social institutions, even religious organizations or very large corporations, represent purposeful are purposeful in the sense that the, the, uh, their decisions and actions are made collectively and all of the parts are, uh, react with respect to those collective, act, uh, collective uh, decisions. For example, uh, Great Britain in World War II mobilized the, its resources and its people to fight a war and that was a collective action and that was indeed purposeful but it, it emerged from decisions made on behalf of the parts by the leaders. So I think you can, uh, th this is just a, 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 just a sketch of a much more complex argument that I could make uh, in, uh, on the contrary. 
and, and you have the same, say, uh, uh, the same analogy applies to a large organization, a Royal Dutch Shell or a Rolls Royce, that, that where the organization acts collectively and all the parts coordinate their behavior with respect to the purpose of the whole. And those purposes may change as a result of decisions that are made, one way or another. Yes, I, I, I think purpose is a product of, of, of the individual Could mind. You stick it to the Sorry, I, I think purpose is a product of the individual mind. It's something that you give to something. I do not think that it's something that societies can give. You, you don't think organi org organi organizations we, are purposive, uh, goal-directed? If you don't like purpose, how about goal-directedness? Is the Royal Dutch Shell organization goal directed? There is a goal within it, but you ask the people. Within it? There are goals that emerge from it, but you ask the people within it what their goals are, and I do not think that you'll find that they all coincide with the goal of the society, of, of, the, of the organization. Yeah? Uh, uh, well, I would hope the leadership at least knows what the goals are. It's a, it's, a long, it's a long conversation that needs to be done. Yes, but well, I, we I have a whole hour at I noon. Find, I find the, 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 that is, it, purpose is a very important product, but it's something that we give, right? And it is evolutionary very important, too. I, but I don't want to go into that. It's if too you deep. want to call it an emergent, if that makes you feel more comfortable, that's fine. Yeah. I, I'm perfectly happy to say that the goal, goal, uh, organizational goals are emergent phenomena. Well, I th uh, yes, I mean, it, it's clearly true that cooperation, where it works, will enhance survivability. And that you know, can't be gainsaid. I mean, that's where Dawkins falls down very heavily. It's not the selfish gene. There are not a single gene in it's my body. It's the cooperative gene, there actually. There are millions of genes in my body. There's a whole set in each, each cell. They don't, they don't all fight. They cooperate. Um, I, so call, I, I, I a, call it the uh, selfish uh, genome, by the way. Yeah, but that doesn't exist. Show me one. Pardon me? Show me a genome. Show me a genome. It doesn't oh. exist. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's, it's an artifact of the mind. No, it, it's, it's a complex interdependent system uh, with about, thir in humans, about 35,000 individual genes. In fact, about 3,000 of those genes were required oh, to make your brain. The, whole, the set. But each cell has a set of genes. I, uh, let's not go into it. It's a, it's a, it's a, <laughs> and I'll, I'll be in my body. I must ask you to keep the microphone closer. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no one can hear yeah. you. Uh, I'll, I'll give the floor to somebody else. Are there other questions? How are we doing on time? You talked about a normative framework. Have you ever tested it? Pardon me? You talked about developing a normative framework. Have you ever tested it? Tested the normative? A normative framework for making ethical decisions. No, of course not. This, is, this is brand new. It's only in press right now in, in, at, at a very conceptual uh, and theoretical level. Uh, these principles are not new. None of them are new, but what I argue is that, that it putting them together in a package, the combination creates a synergy among them that doesn't exist. <clears throat> if you emphasize merely basic needs, as some, you know, uh, liberals, socialists have done, uh, and, and egalitarian principles, or conversely, classical economics and market economists emphasizing, essentially emphasizing merit, the term I use to embrace uh, capitalist principles. Uh, and and uh, the, the idea of putting those things together and then putting together w and then including in a principle that provides for equity in the sense of contributions and benefits from society, uh, it, it represents a new package. But this is, this is the first step. I haven't even written the book yet on this, much less would, actually. Would that mean then that there would be uh, some way of having a particular type of convers ethical conversations based around each other's needs and the impact and the consequences? Would it lead to a specific type of conversation? Oh, oh absolutely. Uh, um, where, uh, where these terms would be, more, would be meaningful and we'd understand and we'd be able to negotiate let, them. Let me give you one very concrete example. Um, uh, my wife and I recently uh, 
I saw a, 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 a television show that, with a documentary, a r report, much like some of the things that are done on the BBC, uh, on uh, the, the impact of privatization in Senegal, uh, where farmers and, and rural populations for generations had free access to water. And they privatized the water supply. And the prices were such that many of the people living in those area, rural areas in Senegal no longer can afford to buy water. And I don't think there's any argument in this room that water is a basic need, fresh water that's potable water. Uh, the only recourse that many of these people had was for the women to carry these large plastic containers, bowl, uh, 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 pots, uh, some miles to wells that were polluted and where the water that they brought back was causing disease in, their chil in the children. This is a basic need de de denied by the marketplace. There is a conflict between merit and, and capitalist principles and the meeting of a basic need. And here is a prime example to me of where compromises need to be struck because the basic needs should take priority. Somehow the basic needs of, the, of this population, basic water needs, should be met. Now there are various mechanisms and formulas that can be used to do that from providing free access to subsidizing access to uh, 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 providing lower uh, prices for uh, people in lower income groups. Uh, you, you, you know all the different kinds of ways in which we can do that sort of thing. Uh, but, but that is to me an example where there is absolutely no question about what, what sort of uh, policy should be pursued. And it grows out of that paradigm. So there was a conflict there that didn't get resolved, though. And if they it had hasn't as of now. So they, had a, they, they resolved it, did they? Pardon me? They resolved it. No, not, not as of last week. Perhaps it will be resolved, but, but right now, uh, many people are suffering. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, oops, I'm sorry, sorry. My name is Gerard Tezeo from the University, well, Lincoln, let us say. Um, I'm trying to think about your system and appreciate what it is you try to do. So I see before me a system that is actually trying to satisfy the needs, making it more equal, ethical, etc. You started out, on the other hand, by claiming that there may be catastrophes that actually are destructive to any system. So how would you elaborate the mechanism if you say a more ethical system would be also more competent to deal with droughts, um, all kinds of uh, lack of, let us say, um, uh, or too, many, too much heat provided by the, by the sun, etc. Maybe asteroids coming to the earth, whatever. Would you think that an ethical system is more competent to deal with asteroids? Like, for example, droughts, lack of water, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, absolutely not. <laughs> uh, uh, I've I've spent a few years in the real world myself, and and certainly don't think that ethics can solve our problems. They define the values that we want to pursue, uh, and. Uh, and define the, our relationships with one another with respect to pursuing those values. Uh, but the actual instrumentalities that we use to defeat asteroids or generate new water resources are, are obviously matters relating to e economics and technology and the mobilization of capital and resources in order to be able to do those things. Uh, so there's, you know, there's absolutely no question that, that uh, there is a, a fundamental role for the private sector and the market system in meeting our basic needs. 
the, 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 the market economies have been enormously successful in doing that, by and large. But some needs have fallen through the cracks for some portions of even <clears throat> the population living in a, in a complex modern society. In the United States, for example, uh, the official poverty line is about 11% of the population. But in fact, no less than 20 studies, and by now it's probably 21 studies, I know of 20, that have unequivocally shown that the estimate used for the official poverty line figure in the United States is vastly understates the reality, and that in fact more like about one-third, between 25% and one-third of the population are living in more or less extreme poverty, and in, and in a good many cases, Basic needs are not being satisfied. Even health care is sometimes unavailable in the United States, even in emergency rooms where it's supposed to be free in hospitals. So the, 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 the existing economic system is failing to some degree. And under extreme stress, catastrophic environmental changes, the existing system could fail to a much greater degree in meeting basic needs. What this ethical paradigm says is that basic needs come first and that our resources need to be mobilized to assure that our basic needs are met under different conditions. Uh, whether you believe that the future will be more of the same and, and we can, you know, we'll, we'll make, you know, uh, more or less continuous progress, economic progress, or if you believe that we face some severe uh, uh, possibly catastrophic changes in the future. And, and, and the answer is that in coping with those catastrophic problems, we want to keep in mind that meeting the basic needs of the population is the priority, and profits, if you will, come second to that. Okay, one quick question. We have about one minute before um, the end. Okay, thanks, Rob. <laughs> Maybe we no, should do it, this after the... I, I was uh, very fascinated by your basic needs. Now, perhaps the, the question that has been left in my mind is the extent to which you have been focused on individual needs at the expense of holistic needs, in the sense that I would expect that uh, we work towards other people, a basic need of people, is to operate in organizations that enable them to, to cooperate and develop themselves and not to uh, offend other communities, other organizations as well. Right. So where do you put that uh, organizational holistic need in the context of your ethics? I'm not sure if I really understand the question. Uh, could you maybe restate it in a slightly different way? There, it, 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 <coughs> uh, I, I'm not this ethical system, yes, it focuses on individual needs because that's where you have to start, yes. and that's that's the basis for defining a biological need, a survival need. But you aggregate those needs into populations, and the, the needs of a population, which is which is a, granted a, a summing process. It's a, a simply an arithmetic problem. But then, the survival of an organization, per se. To my mind, it, its survival is, it, it, in this ethical framework, is in, either is or is not instrumental to meeting our basic needs. T to take an example, the Philip Morris uh, cigarette manufacturing firm could be dispensed with, I think, with, uh, and, the, and the, the, the fields that are now under production for tobacco could be utilized for growing food for survival if mm. indeed there was a desperate shortage of arable farmland because of what might happen in the state of California as a result of a severe drought. But, but there are other solutions to the problem, like one of the things that could be done in the state of California is to anticipate what might occur by undertaking even now a major development <coughs> of water desalinization uh, utilizing solar technologies or uh, uh, so, solar technology, 
or windmill technology, both of which are becoming competitive in, in the marketplace against other forms of, of energy. I mean, there's some difference still. But with subsidies, it could become very attractive to use an environmentally friendly energy production technology coupled to massive desalinization plants that would create not just uh, 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 answers to short-term water needs, but would also create the technological capabilities and infrastructure for expansion to deal with a much larger problem. So there are both technological, economic, and market solutions to some of these problems, as well as, uh, as uh, uh, ones that relate to changing our policies and, and our Perhaps the point I was trying to emphasize there, and I know that we don't have time to continue this, but is the relationship between individual and the organizations in which they operate, and wow. the extent to which this is a fundamental need for survival in the longer run, because clearly our organizations collectively lead to decisions and actions that later on we have to regret. And that may well destroy human nature, uh, independent of what individuals may do. So, yeah. I mean, sorry yeah. to interrupt, but yeah. for, for, um, perhaps we could continue that, that, um, that conversation um, in Peter's session at 12.15 now. Yeah. And um, we are now going to adjourn for coffee for <laughs> roughly 25 minutes um, on the third floor, um, room 302.